This is the video on the mitochondrion, which is the organelle important for cell respiration within eukaryotic cells. So a couple characteristics about the mitochondrion. One is that it makes up a very large portion of the cell's uh, overall cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic volume. And then the second thing is that it's very essential for the evolution of metabolism as a whole in complex organisms such as ourselves. So in other words, if we didn't have the mitochondrion, we would have to rely on anaerobic glycolysis for the production of ATP. And if we relied on anaerobic glycolysis for the production of ATP, we certainly wouldn't have as much ATP produced per glucose molecule than we do now with the mitochondria. Because, and as it says here, glycolysis releases a very small amount of the total free energy that is potentially available. Whereas when those two pyruvate molecules enter the mitochondria, um, when they're oxidized into uh, CO2 and water, then that, act, that whole process allows for about 15 times more ATP to be made than what would be made with glyco um, anaerobic glycolysis alone. So the fact that we have the mitochondria is a really amazing evolutionary advantage for us in terms of producing energy. And then the next thing is that mitochondria are very mobile organelles and they're constantly changing shape. So there's this really common misconception that a lot of mitochondria look like this and that a lot of them look like they're kind of these pill-like shape or they're a long uh, cylinder-like shape or whatever. But the truth is, is that not all mitochondria look like that. So mitochondria can... Um, they can change shape, they can move, they can be long, uh, they can be wrapped around, they can be, or they can be spherical. I mean, there's different orientations that the mitochondria can take on, and it really just depends on the cell that it's in, and it depends on whether or not it is attached to microtubules. So mitochondria in general, they can like I said, they can be different shapes, they can also fuse together, they can separate from each other, and whether or not they are associated with microtubules depends on uh, what their shape and their orientation is going to be like, and then ultimately how they're distributed. So some of the mitochondria are long and moving, and whereas others are very packed tightly together. Um, so for example, the cardiac muscle example right here, these mitochondria are very packed tightly together amongst myofibrils. And then over here is a sperm tail. And the sperm tail, the mitochondria is what's in red, right? And that's, they're wrapped around um, the, axen the flagellar axenema. So, I mean, it's, it's very different depending on the cell and it's different depending on whether or not they are associating with microtubules. Okay, so now we're getting into the parts of the mitochondrion. So there's different subcomponents, okay? We have the outer membrane, we have the inner membrane space, we have the inner membrane, we have the cristae, and then we have the matrix. And all of these different parts of the mitochondrion are very important for respiration. And they all have their different roles. So we'll start with the outer membrane, which is down here. The outer membrane is the area that is colored in red. It is on the outermost part of the organelle. The outer membrane contains a lot of transport proteins and it's semi-permeable, just like all of the membranes that we've discussed so far. Most of the transport proteins in the outer membrane are considered porin transport proteins, so that means that they have or they form a very aqueous environment, okay, and it's like a channel, so to speak. So it's analogous to the aquaporin that we've talked about with transporting water molecules across, right? So these transport proteins called porins, they form very aqueous channels through the bilayer. So with that being said, because there's a lot of transport proteins, um, the outer membrane is semi-permeable, okay? So some molecules can enter through and some cannot. And obviously the ones that can enter through are the ones that are very important for respiration. So specifically speaking, pyruvate, okay? So the outer membrane contains transport proteins for shuttling pyruvate into the mitochondrion. But of course, pyruvate is not the only thing. We can also transport um, NAD and FAD and the water molecules and things like that, okay? Then we have the inner membrane space, which is right in here. 
okay? It's like that off red color. The inner membrane space is a lot like the cytosol in comparison with, you know, characteristically speaking. Uh, the inner membrane space is really just an area for the molecules that are being transported back and forth to accumulate. And that's why it says inner membrane space, the small space to quickly accumulate protons. And it's, it is selective or selectively permeable, so to speak. Um, I mean, it's not a membrane, but it is selectively permeable in um, its contents, okay? But it's definitely not as selective in its contents as the matrix would be, okay? So, but by that I mean that this outer membrane is selectively permeable, yes, but the inner membrane is a lot more selectively permeable. Okay, so then moving on, uh, the major parts of the mitochondrion where all of the work happens is the inner mitochondrial membrane and the matrix. Okay, so we'll start with the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that is right in here where my arrow is following, okay? So the inner mitochondrial membrane, again, it is also selectively permeable. And like I said a little while ago, um, you can argue that it's more selectively permeable than the outer membrane. And so it does contain a lot of different transport proteins to move molecules that are specifically involved with cell respiration. And so these molecules would be considered you know, uh, pyruvate, it would be considered uh, water and the NAD and the FAD. Um, it would be considered hydrogen ions, uh, also different enzymes that are necessary for oxidative phosphorylation in general and things like that. So there's three main types of proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. One of them are the proteins that are involved in the oxidative reactions within the electron transport chain because again, this is where the electron transport chain happens. The second type of protein is ATP synthase, and that's where, that's the protein that actually produces ATP. And then the third type of protein are just general transport proteins that move the um, molecules involved in respiration across the membrane. The other thing about the inner mitochondrial membrane that's extremely important is that this is where the electrochemical gradient of hydrogen ions is established. So that's another reason why this membrane has to be permeable selectively to small ions. Okay, and so again, the inner mitochondrial membrane, as a review, it contains the electron transport chain and it contains uh, three different types of proteins, one of them being ATP synthase for oxidative phosphorylation. Now, the thing about the inner mitochondrial membrane, uh, before we get to the matrix, right, the second most important part, is that we have this cristae within the membrane. Now, the cristae are folds of the membranes, or you can sometimes call them convolutions. And so the point of the cristae is to increase the surface area of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Because if we increase the surface area of the inner mitochondrial membrane, then you have greatly increased the amount of electron transport chains that can happen in the membrane. And if you do that, then you've greatly increased the, the amount of ATP that can be produced. So, um, for example, like I said, you know, the amount of mitochondria and how they're oriented and shaped and whatnot is different between cells. So if I give you the example of a cardiac muscle cell found in the heart and a liver cell, you know, you might find within the cardiac muscle cell, you might find a lot more mitochondria, and then within those mitochondria, you might find a lot more cristae um, because that would greatly increase the amount of ATP that's being produced. So you would probably find in a cardiac muscle cell, you would probably find about three times the amount of mitochondria and three times the amount of cristae. So therefore, you could produce about three times the amount of ATP than you would in, say, a liver cell, okay? Because the amount of ATP or the demand of ATP in a heart cell would be a lot greater than that of a liver cell. Okay, so then finally we have the matrix. And like I said, there's the two main working parts of the mitochondria, the inner mitochondrial membrane and the matrix. And so the matrix, um, 
Its primary role, well, first of all, this is where the pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle happens all within the matrix. So the matrix has the enzymes that are appropriate to metabolize pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and then to ultimately oxidize that within the citric acid cycle. Uh, the other thing about the matrix is that everybody knows that the mitochondria has its own DNA and this is where it's held, is in the matrix. So within the matrix, the, the you can find the mitochondrial DNA, you can find the mitochondrial ribosomes, you can find the mitochondrial RNA, so like tRNA and things like that that will translate the proteins, and then you can also find enzymes in general that are required for the expression of mitochondrial genes. So the matrix in summary has the appropriate enzymes and a suitable pH for the Krebs cycle, otherwise known as the citric acid cycle, and then it also stores the genetic material of the organelle. So with that, that's um, everything you need to know about the mitochondrion.